Dan. Since last year's FDIC and this year's FDIC, we completed a study on attic fires and exterior fire spread. I don't have a lot of time. I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version. Everything I'm going to talk about, if you go to ulfirefightersafety.com, you'll be able to take a couple hour online training program put together by Julie here in the front row. So if you have questions, you can ask her. There's also a technical report and a fire department summary report. I'm going to skip all the background and I'm going to go right into the tactical considerations. So as a little bit of background, we looked at 28 different exterior walls, eight foot by eight foot walls. What we were getting at is as wall construction changes over time and we go from solid wood, maybe cedar, to stucco, to vinyl over wood, to vinyl over foam over wood, to vinyl over foam over foam. All of these things are going to change what you arrive to. So we wanted to look at all different types of wall constructions that will commonly be found across the country. Then we wanted to look at, att at some attics and how does the fire go up the wall and get into the attic space. So we burned three different types of 16 by 16 walls that had a section of attic over top of it to look at that transition from wall to eave to attic. Then we went ahead and we built four full-scale attics, lightweight construction, little over a thousand square feet, looking at how fire grows and spreads in an attic space, how it becomes vent limited, and we looked at multiple different tactics to put those fires out. And then we went to the city of Milwaukee where we got three acquired structures where we looked at different knee wall fires, how fires spread in knee walls and different tactical considerations there. Here's a look at uh, pretty much how the increased use of plastics are going to change what you arrive to. The one on the left is a vinyl product or a polypropylene product that is meant to simulate wood siding. The one on the right is wood siding. The pictures on the bottom are two minutes after the picture on the top. So two minutes into fire growth, you see very different fire behavior. Obviously, if you show up at six minutes, eight minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it is, you're gonna see a very different size up consideration when you arrive. Here's another look at a little bigger scale. Here's our 16 by 16 wall. We looked at three different types of construction. The one you're going to see on the left is two by four stud walls with half inch plywood with four inch overlapping vinyl siding on top of it. The one in the middle, all it does is it replaces the wood with a rigid foam board. And the one on the right also replaces it with the rigid foam board, but it also has spray foam in the, uh, as insulation. And here you go side by side by side. The cutout on the bottom gives you a view in the attic. One of the things you're going to see right off the bat is with foam, the one all the way to your right, it's not a vented attic. That foam blocks the eaves and makes the attic part of the conditioned space. So if you want to get fire in that attic space, you now need to burn through six to eight inches of foam in order to get into the attic. We start a small fire on the outside. In this case, it's 100 kilowatts. That could be a small trash can, that could be a pile of wood, it could be a decent amount of mulch. If it were a car or a bigger trash can or a garage, obviously that'd be even worse. Coming up on a minute and a half. So if you look at the one in the middle, vinyl over rigid foam, we wind up with an attic fire in less than two minutes. None of you are getting to getting a call, getting to the scene, getting water on the fire in less than two minutes. So with this new type of exterior wall construction, you're looking at transition from a small outside fire to an attic fire well before your arrival. And once it's in the attic, as you know, it's game on from there. One thing that really stuck out as we did this research was the importance of wetting sheathing. As we understood the fire dynamics of how fires grow in an attic space, 
As you'll see here, we're going to introduce 150 gallons per minute in through the eave line after we hook the eaves open. In this case, there were aluminum eaves on the soffit. 150 gallons a minute, about 15 seconds worth of flow on either side into a well-involved attic that had vented through the roof. Used right around 75 to 80 gallons of water and knocked down the entire attic fire. So then we start trying to understand why this is. And if you understand how attics ventilate, and how they're constructed and how they work, pretty much the attic needs airflow on the underside of that decking in order to keep it from developing mold. So to keep it from developing mold, you put the eaves in, and then you put a ridge vent. It can either be a plastic ridge vent or it can be ridge caps, whichever. As the sun heats the roof, it creates a natural flow. Air in low, hot gases out high. So when you have a fire that gets into the attic space, that's exactly how it grows and spreads. If you were to build a campfire, you take a whole bunch of sticks, you'd put them in a triangle shape, kind of like a teepee. You would allow air in low, hot gases out high, and it would burn pretty well. That's how our attics are set up. You set them up in a teepee, you let air in low, hot gases out high. Flames want to spread where the fire triangle exists. That fire triangle is going to exist at the sheathing. The air is going to ride in, match the fuel of the off-gassing sheathing, and we have our fire. So if we can put water there to wet that down, cool that off, big chance to get ahead of that fire. Kind of like this. The water will ride up one side of the sheathing and ride down the other side of the sheathing and rain down on everything in between. We calculated the surface area in that attic space, and we're looking about 70% of the burning surfaces are actually the sheathing itself. We did a little demonstration so you can see where the water goes. As that water rides up every joist channel, it's wetting the sheathing and you watch it rain down on everything in between, severely soaking everything in that attic space. It was really effective. If the fire starts on the outside, start fighting it from the outside. If you have an exterior fire that has a hold of the outside of this building, whether it's a mulch fire that extended on the outside, whether it's a garage on fire, car on fire, deck on fire, porch on fire, you name it, if you don't take the heart of the fire away, you are not going to be able to get ahead of it. So if you commit to the inside of this structure, and you get up into that knee wall area of that house, you can flow water all day long unless you take away the source of burning on the outside. It is going to continue to replace that heat, and it's going to continue to replace it, the gases with unburned fuel coming from the exterior. You've got to be able to knock down that outside fire. And then as you knock down that outside fire, be smart about it. Why is the fire able to spread from the exterior into the eaves, into the attic? Because there's a flow path there. If the air can flow there, the fire can flow there. So if you understand building construction, you understand where the heat and the flames can go, that's where you want your water to follow. So don't just focus on the base of the fire on the exterior. Think about where it's going and have your water follow the same path the fire is following. So as you knock down that fire, get the water in the eaves, and if where the fire is going, your water is following, chances are you're gonna knock down 95% of that fire just by taking advantage of that fact. Learn to anticipate where and how an exterior fire is gonna mitigate, gonna migrate to the interior. We saw that over wall, wall construction changes over time are greatly going to influence how the fire goes from the outside to the inside. So what we saw with older construction styles was that normally if you had a piece of wood on the exterior, whether it was wood, solid wood boards or plywood or OSB, it would take a significant amount of time to eat through that and then it would have to get through the drywall to the interior. 
And drywall is a phenomenal fire barrier until we go ahead and we start making holes in it. So when you have things in the middle, like fiberglass insulation will slow it down. When we go to newer things where we have plastic, plastic, plastic drywall, another thing that we started to see was this scenario right here, where we replaced our metal outlet boxes with plastic outlet boxes. So now you have a fire that, even though the drywall is a great fire barrier, it's going to migrate from the outside to the inside through the plastic penetrations. So if you have a sofa up against that exterior wall, all it's going to take is a double outlet box or a single outlet box. You're now going to have an ignition source to your sofa on the interior or your curtains or things like that. So if you go ahead and start your overhaul on the interior, anticipating where those penetrations are, that's your best place to start. Attic fires are commonly ventilation-limited fires. As Dan discussed what ventilation-limited means, you can have a tremendous fuel load in an attic, and typically there's not a lot of ventilation. Whether you have the ridge vents at the top, whether it's a plastic ridge vent, metal caps, whether you have gable ends, and typically there's not a lot of outlets. So when you don't have a lot of outlets, you will quickly fill that attic with smoke. Without enough air coming in, you're going to see the eaves start to breathe. The eaves then try and act as an air inlet and an exhaust outlet as well. So the attic's going to start breathing in and out, which is really inefficient. So if you really want to get that attic fire going, you go ahead and you make a hole in the roof because it wants the exhaust to allow for more inlet, which is why it's critical if you're going to use vertical ventilation as a tactic to time it really well. That if you go ahead and make your 4x4 hole on a ventilation-limited attic fire, it is going to greatly increase the air that's going to move in, and you will light up the attic. Now, it's not going to be instantaneously, depending on how long the attic's been burning, how fuel-rich it is, and what was actually on fire. There's a number of variables there. But the one thing's a constant. It's looking for the exchange of hot gases out high and cool air in low in order to burn optimally. So if you can time your water going in, taking advantage of the compartmentation of the attic space and the steam conversion to get ahead of the fire and then open up your vertical vent to get that lift, you're in good coordination. Plastic ridge vents. As we move from metal caps and gable ends to more plastic ridge vents, what we saw in every test was they act as a pretty good ventilation point to start until they heat up and then they seal on themselves. As you can see in the pictures here, it didn't take long for that plastic and the holes with the outlets to sit on itself and now completely remove your outlet from the equation. So if you pull up and you see a picture like we have on the right here, where you've got heavy smoke pushing out of the eaves, that's your telltale sign right there that you've got a ventilation-limited fire in the attic because the smoke doesn't want to come down and out. The smoke wants to go up and out. So that's a really good size-up factor that tells you, hey, I need to get some water in here. I've got a ventilation-limited fire. And really, the quickest way to do it, if eave attack is an option, it's a good one. And it doesn't need to be always done from the outside as well, which I'll show you in a second. Attic construction affects steep stream penetration. Again, it sounds obvious after you look at it, but in many cases, where do we apply water into an attic from? Number of, number of ways. On the one all the way in the top left corner is coming in through a gable end. When you come in through a gable end, you're immediately up against the sides of all the joists. So no matter what angle you get at, you wind up like the picture we have in the top corner here, where you're, even if you get really steep, ultimately you're only affecting about a third of the attic 
because you can't get water to move down the rest of the attic because it's hitting the sides of the joists and raining down. So if you have a fire in that attic coming out of both sides, you're not going to knock the whole thing down from one gable end because you're not going to be able to wet all those surfaces. You may be able to stop the fire from coming out of one end, but you're going to have to get around to the other end and hit that, and that may not be enough either. You may have to get up on plane and get in through that gable end and hit more surfaces, but again, that becomes an extreme challenge because no matter what angle you direct your stream, you can put the water directly out the other side, but if you don't wet the burning surfaces, <clears throat> the fire's going to come right back. All you're doing is putting out a little gases, and then they're going to come right back. The one in the middle is attacking the fire from the interior. If you have all the surfaces burning in the attic, you're essentially going to have to pull down large chunks of the attic space to get water on the sheathing from below. So you go room by room by room chasing the attic fire around the house, and ultimately what you're trying to do is you're trying to wet all the burning surfaces. So it can be pretty inefficient that as you put the stream to the left, you hit a side of a rafter, put a stream to the right, you hit a side of the rafter. What you can do is if you get it up there and you get the gases burning out of play, then you can get your attic ladder up there, get water on the rest of the surfaces, which has been pretty productive over time, but you got to understand what's actually working. And then finally, the Eve attack on the bottom right shows you that you're able to wet all of those surfaces from one location. Here's what a gable end attack looks like. You can see that the water hits the side and rains down and does not penetrate into the attic space. Only wetting about the first 8 to 10 feet of the attic. Now, how do we take advantage of the ability to wet the sheathing, but we can't have access to the eaves? Let's say it's a second floor, and it's going to take too long to get the eaves hooked. What other things can you do? Well, here's the case where you can get to the interior. You know you've got an attic fire. You can focus your truck work on hooking one wall or the other, the front wall or the back wall, and then go ahead and direct your water up the sheathing and down the other side, and you can be a little more strategic about how to best wet the most of that attic and take advantage of the construction of the attic to allow your water to cool the most surface as possible. Let's say you've got a two-story house. In this case, we've got a center hallway. So let's go ahead and take advantage of the construction. We've got a center hallway that goes side to side on the entire second floor of that house. Go ahead and hook a trough down the center of that hallway. Just make sure as your hose line comes up that water goes down one side, water goes down the other side, and you're focused on wetting the sheathing as you move through that attic space. Consider flowing water up instead of down with a master stream. We see this quite a bit. We go ahead and we switch to defensive operations because we've got fire coming out through the attic space. We go ahead, we put up the big guns, and we go ahead and we flow about 500 to 1,000 gallons per minute down through the hole. Is water going on fire there? Sure it is. Water's going on the flames that are coming out of the roof. Where is the actual fire triangle happening at? Where is the fuel being produced that's mixing that you need to wet? Underside of the roof, right? All you're doing is putting water on the gases and probably trying to fill the house up from the basement all the way up. And if you're able to get the house to hold water till the water gets all the way into the attic, then you're going to win. Rarely works. What if instead of flowing down, take advantage of the construction and get water up underneath, even though you don't see fire? Figure out where the fire's coming from and wet where it's coming from, not where you see it. You'll be much more effective. I think taking advantage of this, instead of taking time to get the ladder up, get the eaves open, get water flowing up, you're going to turn a lot more defensive fires back into offensive fires by getting ahead of the fire. Here's another example. You get these larger, lighter weight construction homes with fire in the attic space, 
we tend to put our ladder up above the peak, and in this case, they're flowing down into the gable side. That's where the fire is. But what fire are they actually putting out? Very little. They're just putting out the side that the water is flowing in, and as they flow, fire stops coming out. But if they stopped flowing, the fire would come right back because all they're doing is putting some of the gases out. They're not getting water on what's actually burning. If they went ahead and dropped that tower down, opened up those eaves, and flowed up the front of the structure and put it where the fire's coming from, as opposed to where they see the fire, there's a chance that they make much more uh, headway out there. Apply water on a knee wall fire at the source and towards the direction of spread before committing to the attic. We talked about this a little bit already. The picture on the left there, you pull up, you got fire coming out, you got a room and contents fire, except that fire is lapping into the eaves. That fire lapping into the eaves is going to start spreading on the underside of the attic space. Start getting into a knee wall and start spreading into the peak as well. So once you get your line up to that second floor and you knock that room fire down, take a couple extra seconds to hold the line out the window and shoot it into the eave the same direction the, the fire was going into the eaves, put some water into the eaves, and then go ahead and get a line up on the floor above and start opening up the knee walls. That little extra step could save you a heck of a lot of trouble. Same thing on the outside fire. Understand where the fire is coming from and where it's going, and take that extra few seconds to sweep that area with your hose line. Knee wall fire dynamics. Many of us understand, or we should all understand, how these knee walls work. Pretty much we take an attic space, we finish it off, we create little triangles in the corners and a triangle at the peak that are all connected to each other through the joists and rafters. Fire gets up into that space, grows in that space. We tried to replicate a scenario that we see all too often. Engine company, truck company, either one or the other or both, come up into the half story at the top of the home. They're looking for the fire. They start venting windows looking for the fire and they're not finding the fire. So they start making their way towards the front of the house, room by room, looking for that fire. And in many cases, they get to the front of the house and they're not finding the fire, so they start opening the knee walls. Or a crew comes in behind them and starts opening the knee wall behind them. Or in many cases, the crew coming up made a hole when they got to the top of the steps, but not much was going on, so they move ahead to the front of the attic. And then all of a sudden, things go bad, and we've got firefighters bailing out of that attic space. Well, what's going on with the fire dynamics there? Here's an example of we opened up uh, about a three foot by three foot opening in the knee wall and watched how quickly things could begin to go bad. And the trick here was because you have such a fuel rich ventilation limited condition in that knee wall, it could take five minutes after opening that area of the knee wall before things really start going bad. So on the fire ground, think of what you're doing three minutes after you make that opening. You've possibly moved on to like three other tasks from the moment that gets opened until things go bad. So we have trouble connecting, making that opening in the knee wall, with conditions deteriorating. So if you go ahead and make that opening, it takes a while to get air in there, mix with the fuel, develop the heat, and cause things to go bad. So you might have a crew that makes that hole, stretches their hose line to the front, make another hole, they're looking for the fire, and all of a sudden it comes up behind them, and it was actually an action that looked pretty innocent at the time, but when that mixing got going, things dropped to the floor. So we need to take advantage of the same scenario here, wetting the surfaces in the knee wall space. And again, here's where we have the struggles of the construction. As you get a hose line into that knee wall and you spray there, you're up against the rafters all the way down the attic space. 
So if you've got no visibility and you're flowing into that knee wall, you might be hitting the rafter two feet in front of you, and all it's doing is throwing all your water sideways and back at you. You're not getting any penetration down. So you have to systematically work your way down and cool down that attic space, understanding where your water's going, even if you have limited to no visibility in that space. You got to understand that those rafters are working against you. So if you can get your line in and shoot it up and walk your way down that attic space, paying attention to both sides of the knee wall, as well as that peak over your head, cooling as you go, whether you see fire or not, you're going to greatly reduce the chance of having something pop out on you. 